The verse is going to be up on the board, I'm assuming, shortly. And we are going to say it all together at the same time. We might have to do it twice to get on the same line, but we'll, we'll do that if necessary. But it is John 13, 34, and let's read this together. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, you that you also love one another. Very good. I don't think we have to do it again. I think you got it. All right, this is God's word. Praise his name. Let's be seated. So the next passage you'll want to be turned to will be Philippians 2. We'll be there in just a little while. Uh, I said almost in jest, but not quite in jest. Uh, I had wondered how I would approach this and how it would take shape, this uh, series on Christian ethics. And this week, as I was in the middle of it, I probably had less idea of what I was doing and how I was going to do it than ever before. So just know that. And the reason is, is because it's uh, not, it's not an easy subject and it's not easy to approach. And there's so much to read on it. And uh, Ed mentioned last week in our panel discussion, Norman Geisler's book on Christian ethics. And I certainly don't agree with all of Geisler's views. I actually thought the guy that I might agree with the most, who was John Murray, I agreed with the least. And so that's how it goes. So I wound up using a neo-Orthodox guy as my main text. And a fortunate thing happened to me in college. I went to Mercer University and I was taught by just about every professor was neo-Orthodox. And uh, most people call them liberal, but they weren't liberals specifically or technically. They are neo-Orthodox or existentialist. And we got along really good. And I didn't, I didn't give any ground. They didn't try to take any ground. <laughs> They didn't give any ground, and I didn't try to take any ground. We just had a give and take. And it worked out very well because what I learned was I learned what existentialists think. I learned what neo-orthodox people think, and so I can read a book by a neo-orthodox author and get a lot out of it. And, and you know, some of you are saying, yeah, I would never read a neo-orthodox guy, and yet you read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's books or books about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a student of Karl Barth. Uh, who's one of the fathers of the neo-orthodox movement. So there's some good out there, and I, I truly believe that some of those men were, were Christian men. I believe that James Ramsey, who wrote the book, or, or Paul Ramsey, who wrote the book, was. But Geisler's book, just to kind of give you a bridge from last week to this week, and to show you how involved this can be, he says, and, and, and uh, here's something else about Christian ethics I think you need to know. Christian ethics is what is, let's just call it this, let's just simplify it. We, we talk about our values and beliefs, so at the end of the day, it's what's right and wrong for Christians. And, and most of us, we live our lives and we think about our lives in, in terms of, is, is this a sin or is that a sin? Am, am I sinning? Am I not sinning? Uh, you know, am, am I doing the right thing? And so... You know, I, when I talk to Christians about how we live our lives, a lot of times that's what I hear, and it's been a lot of what I've thought through the years. But if you can think about it like this, there's, there's something that's kind of above that, and that is, how should I live? How should I live? What is my baseline? What is the basic foundation of my experience as a Christian? Now, in some ways, Geisler is helpful in this. Geisler starts his book somewhat technical, but he says that Christian ethics have five characteristics. And I, I think I agree with most of this. First of all, Christian ethics is based on God's will. I would say that, wouldn't you? What does God say to his people in the Old Testament and to his people in the New Testament? He says this. He says, be ye holy as I am holy. Be something that is otherness okay secondly he says Christian ethics is absolute it is based on God's character and that's true 
because we, 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 I think if there's one thing the New Testament teaches us as far as the teachings of Jesus, we're certainly not saved by the example of Jesus. We're not saved by keeping the example of Jesus. But when we are saved, Jesus is our lawgiver. And we read the passage this morning, which for me is the basic Christian ethic. Now, there's a lot of, lot of, to work through when you say, this is my basic Christianity, that Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I've loved you. There's, there's something to be unpacked there, for sure. For example, what does he mean by love? And we'll unpack that. So, and I'll get into that in a minute. So Christian ethics is based on God's character, but we see that in Christ. So we're, we're followers of Christ. Thirdly, Christian ethics is based on God's revelation. And God has two kinds of revelation. He has general revelation. There's a law written on every person's heart. And then there is special revelation, which is the Bible, which tells us about God. Fourth, he says Christian ethics is prescriptive. It is based upon what ought to be and not what is. Now that one can get very complicated. But I think on the, on the, at the height of it, it is descript or prescriptive. I almost slipped there. But I, sometimes it can be descriptive. Is it, is it all or is it the goal? And finally, he says Christian ethics is the ontological. It is duty-centered and not goal-centered. That's, that's tricky, too. Now, when you study Christianity and you compare Christian ethics to other ethics, which is why I'm segueing from last week to this week, he says there are six kinds of ethics. Six kinds. First of all, there's antinomianism, which says, simply, there is no law. There is no law. Everybody does what is right in their own eyes. Now, that brings chaos. We all know that. The second kind of ethic is called situationism. Uh, Joseph Fletcher is the, the father of this, especially as, as you think about neo-Orthodox theology. But situationalism says simply this, there's one law. And that law is love. And by the way, I, I, I don't think he's right. I think the overarching commandment is about love, but I don't think that you can narrow down all laws and say this is about love, because it's not. That's, that's too easy, and what it leads to is relativism, where, you know, if, if, if this is the best for you, then this is what you should do. And we see a lot of that today in our culture, don't we? You know, if that's right for you, then that's okay. You know, I, I love you, and I, I love everything about you, and you've got my unconditional love. So if you, if you think that's right, go ahead and be a serial killer. That's really where it goes if you follow it to its end. And then there's call, the third one is generalism, which says there are some general laws, and there's, there's more than one law of love. There's some, there's some general laws, and, and you know, these are laws that you know, kind of make common sense, and this, is, this comes down to pragmatism and utilitarianism. Okay, what's, what's right for the most amount of people, for the, for the biggest group? The fourth is unqualified absolutism. I told you that John Murray, I, I disagree with John Murray a lot. John Murray is an unqualified absolutist. John Murray says there is never, that, that every law is laid out and there is never any excuse for going off the path of any law. So he says this, so you would say in the Bible, how many of you remember Rahab in the Bible? You know who Rahab was? She was the lady in uh, Jericho that hid the spies and they were looking for the spies the 12 spies that that, that uh, Joshua had sent out and they were looking for them or actually Moses had sent out and they couldn't find them Joshua did send them out I'm sorry 
And it might have been 10. Sometimes that gets a little hairy. There's the 12 original spies, and then there's the next group of spies 40 years later. And she hides them, and she deceives the people who are looking for them because if they found them, they would have killed them. John Murray says she should have told the truth. Rahab, have you seen the spies? Oh, yeah, they're up here on my roof. <laughs> and he says God would have worked that out. So Corey Ten Boom, have you seen any Jews, Corey? Uh, yeah, they're in my closet. Absolutism, unqualified absolutism says it is never right to lie no matter what. That's unqualified absolutism. And then there is what you think would be the next one, qualified absolutism. <laughs> This, is, this could also be called conflict morality. Whereas sometimes, as with Corey Ten Boom, you have to make a decision, which is worst, which should I do? Should I tell the Nazis a lie in order to save the Jews, or should I give the Jews up so that I can tell the truth? You see, there's a morality conflict there. War is like that. When is a war just? You see what I'm saying, Ronnie? This isn't easy stuff, is it? It's not. The sixth is graded absolutism. So Jesus says to Pilate, yeah, Pilate, you're doing wrong, but those who handed me over to you, they have the greater sin. So sometimes, according to graded absolutism, they're, they're, when you're, again, it can be in conflict moral, morality, sometimes you have to decide between two things, and you decide for which is the better of two evils. Almost like going to vote sometimes, you know what I mean? <laughs> So that's great at absolutism. So I wanted to share that with you to just say this is not simple. And even though it's complicated, you say, well, you know, I can live my life with all of that. And I'm sure you can. But it's, it's like when I was in the ninth grade. When I was in the ninth grade, I took Algebra 1. Y'all remember that? And I went to Algebra 1. And I started with Algebra 1, and I, I discovered something. I had a great teacher, and some of you Cochran guys remember him. I know Lacey will. Frank Walker. I love Coach Walker. He was a great guy. And Coach Walker could teach algebra. And I learned, this is what I learned, that when I got past trying to memorize the steps, and all of a sudden one day, I got it. I just got how all that worked together. It was my algebra aha moment. <laughs> it was one of the last aha moments I ever had in mathematics. <laughs> but I got it, and I understood why. You know, some people can learn and they can memorize things, but some people have to learn things. And I'm one of those people that say, I have to learn things. I have to know. And so you can live Christian ethics, and you can live your ethics as a Christian in one of two ways. You can just say, well, you know, I'll go along, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick and choose this rule or, or this rule, and I'll, you know. Or you can understand why you do what you do. And that's what I'm trying to do in this series, is to help all of us understand why it is we do what we do in order that we can know what is the right thing as Christians. And it's not easy. Again, Herman Melville, one of his no, uh, novels was called Pierre. It was also known as Ambiguities. It was a kind of autobiographical novel, and Melville had a really tough life. You know, I could ask you how many of you read Moby Dick in what, the 10th or 11th grade, and a lot of you would raise your hands. It's a shame if you didn't have to read Moby Dick. I think everybody should read it. I've actually read it twice. I read it once just because I wanted to. But Moby Dick was not well received when he wrote it in 1851. 
It was after he was dead that people started saying, hey, that's a great book. Don't you love that sometimes when after you're dead, people say, hey, that was a great guy. <laughs> but he wrote, and this is what he said because he was very sour about the gospel. He says, it's a volume bound in rose leaves, class with violets by the beaks of hummingbirds, printed with peach juice on the leaves of lilies. <laughs> That was his view of the gospel. The gospel is not like that at all. Christian ethics is not like, Christian ethics is more like labor and fortitude. Because it's a process of discovery and then process of doing truth. So let me say this, and here's a thematic sentence for you. Doing the truth requires knowing the truth. Doing the truth requires knowing the truth. So the question is, we read John 13, 34, and we hear Jesus' command, then the question becomes, and here is the theme of the next, this week and the next two weeks, what does obedient love look like? What does obedient love look like? So the first thing I want us to think about this morning is, all right, what is a Christian and why are Christian ethics important? You say, what do you mean, what is a Christian? Well, I think it's a good question, don't you? I think it's a question. If you, if you say, I'm a Christian, then you should have some definition for that, some reason to believe that you are indeed a Christian. And some of you might say, well, um, I walked the aisle when I was eight years old and I was baptized and so I know I'm a Christian. Okay, maybe that's how it started for you. It didn't start that way for everybody, but maybe it started that way for you. But the question is, as a Christian, what makes you different from everybody else? And if you could sum that up in, in one thought, what would it be? Well, let me share with you what I think is the essence of being a Christian. It's found in Romans 8, from verses 7 to 11. He says, after saying that we have the, 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 the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So there, there is a, a, a group of people who are called people in the flesh, who cannot please God. They are not Christians. What is different about them? Here it is. However, you, he's speaking to Christians here, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. As Christians, the first thing I would say to you is that you belong to Christ. He is in fact your Lord and your Savior. Or you can invert that, Savior and Lord, it doesn't matter. It's like, okay, you, you roll a quarter down the aisle, which goes first, heads or tails? Huh. They go together, don't they? He is our Savior and Lord. So he continues, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of the sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. There's that word, that word that is a sub-theme of the scripture. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that is the Holy Spirit, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you in you so who is a christian a christian is a person who belongs to christ and because they belong to christ they have been regenerated and they have the holy spirit and the holy spirit lives inside of you he indwells you and he enables you and me to live the christian life without that you cannot live christian ethic Non-Christians can't live the Christian ethic. They can, they can try to duplicate it. They can try to copy it. Many have. But they can't live it. And some, to some, it doesn't even make sense. Confucius said this. 
He said, why would you return kindness for evil? He said, because if you return kindness for evil, what will you give for kindness? That's the way the world thinks. Only a Christian knows that answer because he knows what Christ has done in his place. So this is who we are. Secondly, why are Christian ethics important? Well, again, if you, if you think about John, and, and let's turn back there just for a moment. Let's read the context of the verse that we're looking at, verse 34. But let's read John 13, beginning at verse 31. All right? Here we go, verse 31. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and will glorify Him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You seek me, and I said to you, and I said to the Jews, and now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love or have love for one another why is a christian ethic important first of all because it says to the world that i belong to christ that i am a christian all of the entailments that go with being a Christian are wrapped up in these verses. And at the height of this, Jesus says, I am doing this to glorify my Father. So the Christian ethic, first and foremost, says to the world and says to each other, we love each other because we belong to Christ and our desire is to glorify God. That's important. Also, for those who observe, for those who are not Christians. Paul talks about this in 1 in Corinthians chapter 14. What do they observe? What are Christians? If you were an unbeliever and you were looking at a Christian, if, if in your office or in your neighborhood, when people look at you, what do they see? What do they hear? Maybe they don't know you're a Christian. But if they do, if, if in casual conversation or in passing, they said, hey, where do, you, where do you go every Sunday morning? You say, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Well, how does that person perceive what you are about? To, to ask that another way, how does the believer the person who is in Christ, how do they have a bearing on other people's lives? Is it negative? Is it, con is it positive? Is it indifferent? You see, we should want people to understand in some sense what we are about and what we are as we live out obedient love. I was reading another book, and I can't, I, Derek told me the title of it this morning. I think it's Civility in an Uncivilized World by Mao. Okay, yeah, all right. And it is uncommon to be civil in a, the world in which we live, but it's, I think it's a very important thing. So he said, this guy said he was on an airplane, and this guy, or no, he was on a bus. I'm like, first of all, they still have Greyhound buses, but... I think I see one every now and then. So he said he was on a bus, and this guy was moving from seat to seat, and he would talk to people for about 15 minutes, and then he'd get up and, and go to the next person. And he said, after a while, I figured out this guy was doing evangelism. And so he came, and he sat down with me, and he said he started talking, and he was asking me about myself and, you know, and showing interest in me and all of these things. And then after a while, the guy said, well, you know, he, he, then he springs the question, well, what do you think about Christ? And he said, well, I'm already a Christian. And the guy says, why didn't you tell me 15 minutes ago you let me waste all this time? 
Because somebody had told him, you know, what you need to do is you need to act interested in people in order to share the gospel with them. Act interested? That's manipulation. Are you interested or not? How does that bear on a Christian ethic if we try to manipulate people? So, what does obedient love look like? Secondly, I want us to think about righteousness in the kingdom. The Christian ethic is certainly based in both of these. The righteousness of God, first of all, is set forth in Scripture. The world looks at God, and the world does not like God. We talked about Nishi a lot last week. Nishi said, and Nishi abhorred Christianity. But he said, you know, if I really thought there was a God, he said that I could not endure it if I could not be God. And you know what I thought about when I read that? That's Eve in the garden. And Adam falls right along with her, becomes the head of the race in sin because they wanted to be like God. But God gives us his word to show us one of the attributes that he shows us is his righteousness. That he is holy, that he is transcendent, that he is total otherness. And yet at the same time, inexplicably, God in his righteousness, in in his moral purity, in his sinlessness, in his justice, And when you talk about the justice of God, you don't put adjectives on it. There's no social justice with God. There is justice in every aspect. Just. He is absolutely just. Do you know how many people in the world could stand underneath the justice of God if it were unleashed on us? None of us. None. He is just. And yet, in the Old Testament, this righteousness that we see demonstrated in the law, this righteousness becomes the enactment of his salvation. How in the world do you understand that? How can you get at that? We have spoken here in the last few weeks of the progression of God's righteousness through the Old Testament. We see His justice, and His justice is just. And by the way, as Christians, we should be just. But more than that, we should be merciful and gracious. Because in His absolute purity... He decides to create a people for himself that will also be holy as he is holy. How in the world does he do that? How does God create holy people? Not like the Pharisees. The Pharisees in Jesus' day, they thought they they had it. But they didn't. In fact, they were on the other side. In the New Testament, Jesus becomes the righteousness of God. So in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following, having this attitude in yourselves. I told you to, be, to, to leave your Bibles there, so I'm not giving you any time. <laughs> Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, He was holy, holy, holy. Absolutely just. Did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But He emptied Himself 
taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason also God exalted him, highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee would bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and all under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So Jesus has come to us, and then Paul says in 2 Corinthians, and he also says this in Romans, in many places the Bible says this, that Jesus Christ, who was righteous, took upon himself our sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 and following. He took upon himself our sin that we might be made righteous. How does God make a people righteous? How does God say, I want you to be holy as I am holy? First of all, he does this through paying for our sins through Jesus Christ's death on the cross and Jesus Christ's life. And secondly, he does this by indwelling us with the Holy Spirit of God that we become new creatures in Christ. That's who we are. The second idea that I want to discuss is the idea of the kingdom. So in the New Testament, we see that, and, and everybody knows this in some sense, it's just how do, you, how do you fathom this? Jesus has brought the kingdom. Some say Jesus brought the kingdom, and when the Jews rejected it, Jesus took the kingdom back with him. And that when you read the Sermon on the Mount, the ethics that are in the Sermon on the Mount, they don't count until the millennial kingdom. Others say that the kingdom has been inaugurated, the kingdom is still here, because Jesus went away, but he sent the Holy Spirit in his place. Another, he says. So we have today the already but not yet present kingdom. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is in fact empowered. That's why Jesus Christ is calling out his church and nothing can stop him because his kingdom marches forth. And every one of us as Christians who are members of the church, the church is a, is a visible microcosm of the kingdom of God. And when you read passages like, like the Sermon on the Mount, especially, and then you read the parables and all of these other things, what Jesus is doing, he's not simply predicting something, although in a sense he is, but he is inaugurating something. He is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, this is not a new law. Doesn't write it and say, okay, folks, here's the new law, and here's what you do, and here's what happens if you don't do this. It's not like that. You say, well, it's the super law, the law on steroids. No, it is the essence of the law. Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, the same one who says, a new commandment I give you, he says, I say unto you, and what he is saying is this, that in his kingdom, he is changing the lives of people so that these things that he describes in the Sermon on the Mount, these things will be true of only one people on the planet. That is the people who are in the kingdom of God. That is who you are. That is who I am as believers, as Christians. We have become righteous. We have been indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and our ethic is the kingdom ethic. Jesus Christ. And then finally, just to, to, to look at something now, I've, I've given you two positive things. Let me give you one negative thing. This is not what the Christian ethic is. I want to talk about law and legalism for a moment. Is Christianity a code morality? No. Is Christianity a morality and an ethic that is described in the Bible? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
I could read you the Galatians passage where he says, uh, here are the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, you know the list. These are things that happen because we have the Spirit. And then he says this, against such there is no law. There's no law against being kind. There might be one day, but there's not now. I said the laws of history, it's not common that people penalize you for being kind. They may not like you if you're kind, but they don't penalize you. At least the government doesn't. Is our ethic mainly prescriptive? Is it mainly deontological? Or is it something more? I think there are elements of these things because it is, again, we, we have the Christian ethic that is written before us. But I think what you have to do is you have to base this on biblical theology, on the progression of redemption, on the progression of God's people through the Bible until we get to the point we are today. And we're going to a higher point, aren't we? You see, we're saved now. He describes this in Romans 6. We're saved, and we are able not to sin. Every one of us are able not to sin. In fact, we are able to, to understand the Christian ethic and to live by the Christian ethic. We can do that as believers. But one day, in our next stage, you see that once we were not able not to sin. Right? We were not able not to sin because we were sinners. And then God saved us, gave us the Holy Spirit, and made us able not to sin. Paul says, so therefore, crucify, kill the deeds of the flesh. You can do it. But one day, we will be not able to sin. Not able to sin. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> How will this happen? Because God is changing us. He will glorify us. So the law, God gave the law to Israel. It was, a new, it was the beginning of a new epic. Moses was its mediator. Moses is one of the greatest characters in the Bible. I love Moses. He's a great character. But this, this law was the constitution of Israel. But as we have observed, Israel failed. Israel could not keep the law. And after their failure, they did something else. They lapsed into, I'll just kind of segue here to legalism. In, in the latter days, as the, as the rabbis took over and they began the oral tradition, do you know that in the oral tradition, when the Pharisees in Jesus' day talked about keeping the laws, they had 600, some say 613, some say 621 laws. So there's a Jewish tailor, and when he would leave his house in the evening after he had sewn all day, he was, he was not supposed to put his needle in his tunic, because if he did this and he went outside, this needle was a badge of what he did for a living. And so if he did this and he went outside, you know, it would be all right maybe on, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday. But what if he did it on Saturday? Then it would be, he would be wearing a badge of his occupation, and so it would be a sin, a technical sin. So why did he not wear it the rest of the time? Because he was building a fence around the law. That's what the tradition did. It built a fence around the law. So that Jewish, as Ramsey said, Jewish ethics was a legalism modified by humanitarianism, which meant a humanitarianism limited by legalism. So that when Jesus said in Mark chapter 3, verse 4, when the man with the withered hand, he commanded him to come forth, and Jesus asked the Pharisees, he says, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? And you know what they said? Nothing. They kept silent. 
And Jesus became very angry. The Jews had this, again, this law, this tradition that said, if a man is dying, so, so if you were an emergency room doctor, you could work on the Sabbath and it would be perfectly fine because people who come to you come life or death situations. But if you're a, you know, a, a doctor that sees people who have ongoing problems and they maybe need surgery in the future, then you should never meet with them on Saturday, only on other days of the week because it wasn't an urgent problem. It wasn't life or death. So for these Pharisees, they're saying, you know, a man with a withered hand, that's not life or death. What are you going to do, Jesus? We're just going to watch. And what did Jesus do? He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man, I'm sure the man must have said, that's my problem. I can't stretch out my hand. And he stretched out his hand and it was made whole. Jesus healed him. And they went out and plotted against Jesus. But Jesus said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for me. I am the rest that it points to. So Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. We follow him. But what many people do is they'll fall into legalism. The Russian Mennonites believed, this goes back to, a, I guess, a qualified absolutism. They believed that drinking was a lesser sin than smoking. You know why? Because Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him. You think about that, you'll get it. Legalists build fences around their rules. If you allow square dancing, which might be okay, it could lead to slow dancing. If you allow people to play gin rummy in their homes, it might lead into playing poker in the casino. You see the mindset there. So what we got to do is Barney Fife would say, we got to nip it in the bud. <laughs> but this is not what the New Testament teaches. Paul says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why as if you are living in the world do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use? in accordance with the, comment, with the commandments and teachings of men. These are, there are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. You say, but we need rules. No, what we need is the Holy Spirit that we might live by the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Again, do not hear me as saying there are no rules, there are no laws. I'm not an antinomian by any stretch of your imagination or mine. But I am saying this, that the Christian ethic is proactive, not reactive. The Christian ethic is proactive because it seeks this. What does obedient love look like in my life? And if you're looking for what obedient love looks like, and if that's your desire, beloved, you're not going to need legalism to guide you. You're going to look to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You're going to read the Scriptures and you're going to see what it says about following Jesus. So as you stand, I want to give you three things to think about this week. First of all, only Christians can live out Christian ethics. If you're here and you're not a Christian, if you're watching online and you're not a Christian, you're not going to become a Christian because you live the Christian ethic. You can't live the Christian ethic without first 
the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. It's impossible. Without faith, you cannot please God. First step, you must trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Have you done that? Do you know him as Savior and Lord? Secondly, obedient love is grounded in the righteousness of God and in our experience of being kingdom people. And thirdly, Christianity is not about codified rules. It's not about legalism. But it is the results of God's presence and reign in our hearts. There are many characteristics of the Christian life in the Bible. And we live out of the work that Christ Jesus has done in us, enabling us to, as Paul says, have the mind of Christ, as Peter says, to follow in his steps. And the people said, Amen. Amen. As you pray this week also, pray for TJ and his family. They're going back to Peru. He's going to be on the panel tonight, and then he's going to leave Wednesday, and he's got a pretty tough situation ahead of him, so we want to pray for TJ. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray that in our daily lives that we will know what it is to, to be satisfied in Christ and to live lives that seek to glorify God. Let's pray about that now. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit who teaches us all things, who brings to remembrance things in our hearts as we read your scriptures, who helps us to understand and to apply these things, not just to memorize, but to know there's no substitute for memorizing scripture, but then the application, the knowing it comes with the memorization. It comes with knowing the word. And I pray that we would not be people who would be enamored with just segments of the Bible, but that we would be a people who are informed by the entire Bible as we live our lives each day, that we might truly live them for your glory and to help each other and to live out of obedient love. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.